Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation. In the spring of 1911, my grandmother and her one-year-old daughter, my mother, immigrated to the United States from Europe. I was able to find her original departure documents at the Immigration Museum in Hamburg, Germany. Hamburg was a key departure point for Europeans immigrating to the Americas. Between 1850 and 1934, at least five million people sailed from Hamburg. To handle the traffic, a small city was built near the port. It had 31-story buildings, a church, a synagogue, a hospital, a cafeteria, dormitories, and a playground. Today, the memory of that city is honored with the Ballenstad Museum. Many of the original rooms have been recreated. There are documents and exhibits that relate to almost every aspect of the immigration process. Mannequins in period costumes are equipped with recordings that tell the story of individual immigrants. The buildings that were recreated are in their original spot. They are also the same size and look as they did then. Most immigrants who passed through Ballenstad spent between three and five days waiting for their ship. If any of them were sick, they were brought to the hospital and cared for until they were well. Bringing immigrants to America who were ill was bad business. Ellis Island in New York City and most other immigration centers in the United States had teams of medical officers looking for signs of sickness. If they found anything suspicious, the immigrant was sent back to Europe and the shipping company paid the cost of the return trip. I used the computer program at the visitor center to find my grandmother and my mother. To mark the 100th anniversary of her trip, I decided to sail back to Europe with my wife and youngest son. Since my grandmother failed to buy a round trip ticket, I was able to choose my own accommodations for the return, which turned out to be the Queen Mary II. The ship departed from a pier on New York's Hudson River. As we passed under the Verrazano Bridge, the passengers applauded and expressed their appreciation. Apparently the fact that the ship's height in relation to the bridge was kept in mind while the ship was being built came as a complete surprise to my fellow travelers and a cause for celebration. As we pulled away from the tip of Manhattan, we passed the Statue of Liberty and the old immigration station on Ellis Island. I thought about my grandmother's strength and determination, and I thought about the tens of millions of Americans whose parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents passed through Ellis Island and helped build our nation. A few minutes later, we entered the Atlantic Ocean. We would not see land again for seven days. The great ocean liners are the largest moving objects on our planet. And one of the largest ocean liners is the Queen Mary II. She is 1,130 feet long, 
130 feet wide and 136 feet high. She has 14 decks, a crew of 1,250, and usually carries about 2,500 passengers. Her normal speed is 29 knots, which is about 35 miles an hour. She was built by the Cunard Line in 2004. Cunard is famous for introducing the first regularly scheduled transatlantic service, which they did in 1840. In 1907, the Mauritania came online and set a new standard for speed and luxury. The objective for these early transatlantic ocean liners was to create a luxurious environment, an environment that made the passengers feel that they were spending a week as the guest of a wealthy British relative. Its grand foyer and main dining hall rival the decorative splendor of a palace. 1,000 feet long, weighing 80,000 gross tons, the ship boasted artistic murals created by France's greatest painter. One of the most important breakthroughs in the history of the ocean liner was the introduction of the oil-powered turbo engine. Before that, ships used coal. And as they burned the coal, the ship got lighter. And the lighter the ship got, the more it bounced around, which was not too comfortable for the passengers. With oil burners, the ships were able to replace the burned oil with ocean water, which kept the weight of the ship pretty much the same and gave a much smoother ride to the passengers. In the early 20s, exercise had become an important part of the experience. There was a promenade deck for long walks, a swimming pool, a fully equipped gym. Some ships had squash courts, steam baths, and saunas. One vessel actually had a tennis court, and the game of miniature golf was invented for ocean liners. During the 1930s, ocean liners introduced the Lido deck with a swimming pool. The early liners had dining rooms with long tables and swivel chairs that were bolted to the floor. By the early 20s, there were splendid dining salons with freestanding chairs and extraordinary staircases that gave guests the opportunity to make a grand entrance. Some ships even recreated the famous dining rooms from London's chic hotels. Cunard introduced the Veranda Cafe, designed to look like the front porch of a great hotel. It was located at the rear of the ship and was filled with potted palms and wicker furniture. But of all the comforts associated with the great ocean liners, the most important were those that dealt with eating and drinking. Drinking! Food has always had the ability to be more than just nourishment for the body. Food can be a symbol of wealth and power. It can be a source of emotional comfort. It can be a distraction or an entertainment. <laughs> and there is a considerable amount of scientific evidence that eating can reduce emotional stress. From the beginning, the great ocean liners used food and wine for all of the above. It's interesting to see how much of the original plan is still in operation. The largest dining room on the Queen Mary II is the Britannia restaurant. It is three stories high and clearly designed in the grand ocean-going tradition. We were invited to dine at the captain's table. However, the captain was not a captain. He was a commander, a rank that is considerably higher. I had to have two martinis to get up there. Ah, but it was worth it. The ship is actually rather serious about their martinis. They even offer a course in martini making. A fine mist of vermouth is actually one drop, and that's enough. Traditionally, a martini is made from gin and dried white vermouth. A dry martini has very little vermouth. A wet martini has more vermouth. And a dirty martini gets a splash of olive juice. 
Martinis began to show up in the second half of the 1800s. Gin itself is a mixture of grain alcohol and juniper berry oil that was originally concocted in the 1600s by a Dutch doctor. He believed that it would cure kidney disorders, stomach aches, gout, and gallstones while purifying your blood. The Dutch word for gin is Geneva, and the original stuff is still available in the Netherlands, but without any medical claims. There are a number of stories about how the martini got its name. One claims that it was the result of a group of people who lived in Martinez, across the bay from San Francisco, and every night they would gather in the bar of the Occidental Hotel and have a drink made from gin and vermouth. Another one says it was associated with the Knickerbocker Hotel, and a third associates it with the Martini rifle because it had the same kick. Either way, the Martini's real opportunity was the result of prohibition. It was fairly easy to get a legal gin, and a martini was an ideal and elegant way to serve it. With the repeal of prohibition, gin was even easier to get, and the martini took off. A more recent boost to its popularity came from James Bond with his recommendation to shake but not stir. In keeping with the 150-year-old tradition, of recreating big-name restaurants on board transatlantic liners, the ship has a Todd English restaurant. Todd was born in Amarillo, Texas, grew up in Georgia, lived in Connecticut, went to school in North Carolina on a baseball scholarship, and eventually graduated from the Culinary Institute in New York. Okay, we're gonna put some hearts of palm in there, right? He is an author, restaurant tour and has his own cooking program on PBS. His restaurant on the ship was particularly interesting to me because it's where we held the party for my son's sixth birthday. Happy birthday to you. Excellent. Most of our meals were taken in the Princess Grill which specializes in the preparation of tableside dishes. One of the most popular was the ship's version of Caesar salad. As you probably know, there are numerous varieties of Caesar. There's Julius with shrimp. That's because Julius always liked to go into battle with people who were shorter than he was. Augustus with chicken. He never wanted to go into battle at all. And Sid, who was always good for a laugh. The standard Caesar salad recipe came from Caesar's restaurant in Tijuana, Mexico. The ship's head chef oversees the preparation of 14,000 meals each day. So here you have colada. It's about 18 chefs working here. Now they're doing the preparing the appetizer for lunch. So they do all the a la minute cooking in their own galleys. Each restaurant has their own galley. So then we do, of course, we do a little uh, sugar work, artwork with chocolates and stuff for the buffets. We're making about 1,200 scones every day. And this attached is the cream and the, the jam. Yeah, the so that's going to be the afternoon tea. So you go easily to 1,200 every day. In a year, they go through 250,000 pounds of potatoes, 350,000 gallons of fruit juice, 55,000 pounds of coffee. And most interesting to me, 540,000 toothpicks. Well, one of the important part, or the most important part in the kitchen is uh, the meal count system, which we have in place here. With the amount of guests you have, 1,200 per seating, you need to know a little bit ahead of time how much you need from each meal. So that, that's, for instance, the uh, pork scallopini. Red means now we have to cut more pork. Because you run soon, run, uh, run short, because you're 200 on order, that's what we made, and you're already under 95 on order. That means you have five left. Make more. The, call the butcher, he's one deck below here. Cut me 30 more portions. It takes about five minutes there here. And that's the way up to uh, the restaurant. As you have three levels. So the waiters are having on the third level and the second level. They go first up the stairs, and then they go one down or on the same level up there. It is an amazing setup. Yeah. The ship has four grand dining rooms and nine specialty restaurants. 
One of the more informal rooms was the Golden Lion Pub. The pub is short for public house, and for centuries, the local pub was the major gathering spot in the small villages of England. Everyone came in after work for a few drinks and lots of talk. Traditionally, the windows of a pub are made of smoked glass or covered with curtains, so no one in the street can see you. Clearly, this is not an issue in the middle of the Atlantic. Accordingly, this is the first pub I have ever been in that is filled with natural light. I could actually see what I was eating, which in many pubs is not an advantage. When I worked in London during the late 60s, the food in the pubs, which was called pub grub, could easily have been described as a weapon of mass destruction. The dishes in the Golden Lion are drawn from the classic repertoire of pub grub, but they're quite good. There's bangers and mash, which translates as sausages and mashed potatoes. Fish and chips, deep fried fish fillets, and french fried potatoes. And of course, a wide selection of ales. On the third day of the voyage, I went up to the bridge to talk to the Commodore. Commodore is a military rank that goes back to the French Knights of the Middle Ages and designates someone of great authority. Today it is a rank above a captain, but just below a rear admiral. I was curious as to how he got into this line of work. It was never a conscious decision to aim for this spot. I wanted to go to sea and be a navigator. And that was largely the influence of my father. Uh, he had been at sea in the Navy, and you take with you a culture of being at sea, of being a sailor. And in early life, we grew up in those great entrepot ports of Colombo and Singapore. And so seafaring was always part of it, and coming to sea was just the natural thing to do. Besides running the ship, he is also in charge of an elegant hotel. The people aspect of it is one of the most satisfying and rewarding parts of it, whether as a manager or as a host or as uh, somebody for whom the ship's company can see as somebody who looks after their welfare and well-being. Um, so all of it comes together very nicely. I joined the Queen Mary uh, five years ago, um, so she was just two years old then. I took her on her first round-the-world voyage and many maiden ports in those early years. But I've always been very aware that this is the most magnificent ship in terms of her speed, her power, her beauty, um, her sheer ability to deliver this magnificent product, which has its links with the past. The crossings are all about the weather and the current. Whilst we go east and west across the Atlantic throughout the summer, no route is ever the same as the last. Every time we're looking at what combination of weather and current uh, will give us the most comfortable and the most economic journey or crossing. We aim to do the shortest crossing, but it seldom works out that way. You have some sort of weather or current avoidance built into that. Of course, an essential element for any ship on the high seas is the safety drill. One, two, three, up, three, three, again, and one, two, three, up, three, three, again, and one, two, three, up, three, and stop. As you can see from the public areas, everything on the Queen is rather regal. In fact, Cunard's association with the royal family goes back to 1859, when Queen Victoria bestowed the title of Baronet on Samuel Cunard for his service to the country during the Crimean War. Just for the record, the Crimean War took place between 1853 and 1856. England and France were on one side, Russia on the other. The Ottoman Empire was in decline and the issue became the control of the Holy Land. 
The war stands as a high point in the history of military and political stupidity and incompetence. 400,000 people died in a war that achieved nothing. I like the old days when the head of a country had to lead his troops into battle. Whatever happened to follow me, men? Uh, back to Kennard. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Since then, eight Kennard liners have been named by senior members of the royal family including four by Queen Elizabeth. And in accordance with this special relationship, the Queen Mary II celebrated the marriage of Prince William to Catherine Middleton. They loaded hundreds of bottles of champagne, much of which was used to make a commemorative cocktail for the royal toast. They decorated the Queen's ballroom with British flags. They commissioned a collection of royal wedding souvenirs. I heard that some of the porcelains were based on the designs of the great Ukrainian master, Dmitry Chachka of Odessa, truly a collector's item. They baked a giant fruitcake, similar to the one that would be served to the bride and groom. They prepared a small box with a slice of the cake for every passenger on the ship. And Lord Twining produced a commemorative blend of tea. Tea was the signature non-alcoholic drink of England since the 1600s. Those were the good old days, or the bad old days, depending on your viewpoint, when a European country would take over some other part of the world, declare it a colony, and do whatever they wanted to do to make as much money as they could. Now, the Spanish uh, did a good job of it in the Americas. The Belgians dug up uh, the Belgian Congo and England had a grand old time of it in India. They had two million acres of tea producing plantations in India. They built roads and ports, brought in tools and equipment and managers, and sent millions of pounds of tea to England. The idea of stopping for tea in the afternoon was introduced by Anne Maria Russell, the Duchess of Bedford. And every afternoon in honor of the Duchess, the Queen Mary II serves tea. It was in the early 1800s, a time when the English were getting more and more worked up over the Industrial Revolution, and even rich guys were staying late at the office. Dinner was being served later and later, usually between 7 and 8.30. Lunch had been introduced to fill in the gap between breakfast and dinner, but lunch was a very light meal, and there was nothing to fill in the hours until dinner. Poor Duchess found herself getting hungrier and hungrier, so she decided that around 4 o'clock she would stop for a snack. Oh, maybe a little piece of Dundee cake and uh, uh, cheese sandwiches and a little sandwich with some smoked salmon in it. And um, she liked those little scone things with a big dollop of cream on top and maybe some jam. Just a little something to hold her over until dinner. Well, she began to have such a good time that she invited her friends over. You could sit around, drink tea, eat sandwiches and sweets, and tell the most awful stories about other people. It became the ladies' equivalent of the London Men's Club. It's been going on for over 200 years. These days, men are invited, which has sadly diminished the quality of the gossip. In a desperate attempt to give a significant role to the men, and fill in for the lack of gossip, dancing has been introduced. After seven days at sea and two tea dances, we arrived at Southampton, collected our luggage, and began our new life in the old country. My grandmother would have been pleased. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. For a printed copy of this show, send a stamped envelope and $3 to this address. Please mark envelope with show number. The same information is available free on BertWolf.com.
Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation.